Um, welcome to Protein Innovation, Shaping the Future of Microalgae Foods in Europe webinar. Um, it's a one-hour webinar. We have three excellent um, presenters today. We have uh, Joseph, Israel, and uh, Marie. And they're going to walk us through some of the future innovations that we're seeing in, in plant protein. Um, so we're going to start out with a quick welcome from Gerard, our CEO at Bridge to Food. And then we'll have uh, Joseph's presentation on the future of microalgae and foods. Um, then we'll have a brief Q&A, followed by a presentation on baked goods development with Israel. And then we will have innovations in microalgae and pasta with Marie. And another Q&A, followed by a brief closing from Gerard and, and some insight into future events that we have coming up. Yeah, I think uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, from wherever you're calling in, I'm always excited to know where you're coming from to try to picture your environment, but that's a little bit difficult. If you like, then just mention it in the chat. The purpose of this webinar, the purpose is actually that you will hear about some great science and developments and breakthroughs that are happening within the project. The second is actually that um, there's an opportunity for you to connect with them and maybe form new type of uh, relationships. And the third one is to, that you connect with each other because you might have something that somebody else can need and want. And that's why I think Barb and Shannon are also explaining. Do introduce yourself in the chat, don't be shy. When you give something, you always get something back and all of a sudden you might find that you are connected. Thanks uh, Max from Delft. You have sunshine, I'm sure, because we have sunshine here as well. Now, a few little comments, I think, on this project. The presentations that you will see here are part of a four-year project that has been funded by the European Commission under the so-called umbrella horizon, I think, 2020. The project started um, October 2019, and then, irrespective of COVID, everybody worked very hard to continue and the project will be finished October 2023, a four-year project. 31 organizations being part of that, 13 different countries, probably 10 over universities working on things that are always very important when you start exploring new opportunities. And the EU is very keen on working on new uh, plant proteins, alternative proteins in different stages of development. So this project has a work package on finding new uh, strains. What is the optimal and the best algae? There's work being done on extraction, on purification, on growing, all sorts of things technically huh, to make um, um, the uh, algae work so that you can extract the right ingredients from it. Today is a webinar about the last part, which is very much about finding applications and, and testing applications with existing strains, with new strains that have still been developed. And I think we, you all um, are um, hopefully very happy that you will find um, two expert organizations here that have done great work. It's the IRTA Institute in Spain, a very famous leading institute and uh, from um, uh, Germany, at the border with the Netherlands almost, there's the Dill Institute in Quakenbroek, where my Christine will, will speak about uh, findings in pasta. Um, so that's the, that's the storyline of the webinar. The project will continue for another one and a half years. Um, so feel free to come, come back and ask questions and, and be engaged with everything what's happening. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say about the context. And then I, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Josep um, Coma Posada, if I pronounce it right, Josep, uh, from the IRTA Institute. Uh, you are a work package leader. The work package leader means in the EU terms that you are managing uh, a major part of a project um, for different uh, reasons. And IRTA is the leader of this uh, great project. Great. Well, then uh, thank you very much. And good, at, good afternoon or morning to everybody, depending on where you are coming from. And I will start uh, presenting uh, just a little 
overview of uh, this prefuture project and I will follow uh, with some of our development of food uh, with microalgae. Now, okay, first of all, I would like to, to show uh, this figure that probably many of you have already seen. From this figure, it comes out the importance of protein needs in the near future due to the growth of populations. According to it, in 2050, we will need 52% more of protein. The problem is that the global protein production from conventional sources it is going to be restricted by environmental or technical factors and it is not suitable, sustainable over time. Therefore, microalgae can be an alternative protein source uh, to help to meet this, uh, the population's need. They have a high photosynthetic efficiency with high growth rates and producti productivity compared to conventional terrestrial crops. They do not compete for land with crops used for food or feed production. They have a high crude uh, protein content, about 30-60%, higher than that of a dried skim milk or soy flour or chicken. And their amino acid profile is superior to that of soybean or other plant sources when considering the essential amino acid contents. And it is also a polysaturated fatty acid source. But, uh, of course, uh, several bottlenecks still must be overcome to make a reality the large scale production of microalgal based protein and ingredients and the incorporation of uh, this algal material into palatable food preparations or suitable uh, feed uh, stuff. Therefore, the Prefuture project has the objective to address these bold bottlenecks and to demonstrate the technical and economical feasibility of the innovative solutions, as well as to prepare the market uptake and determine consumer acceptance of the innovative products. The Prefuture project follows a multi-actor approach, bringing together expertise from different fields from academy to industry to develop and validate innovative solutions all along the microalgal uh, value chain. As you can see, from the biomass production and processing to food and feed production, and considering all the aspects related to distribution and logistic, consumer behavior, regulation business model and market strategies. World Package 3 focuses on developing and implementing major innovations in algae biomass production and harvesting by reducing the production cost through strain improvement and selection or package four is assessing at lab pilot uh, plant scale several technologies for the affordable and sustainable production of two types of protein rich ingredients the single cell and protein isolates the work package five uh, for food uh, and feed products is addressing the reformulation at lab and pilot uh, scale of innovative food and feed with single cell and protein isolates to overcome obstacles, uh, the obstacles like defective food structure, undesired color or aroma smell, which may limit their incorporation into the target matrices. The raw package, the food company partners are involved with the, de the development of bread, soups, sport drinks, snack bars, sausages and vegetable creams for the addition of microalgae. Raw package is, is about the scanning at, at industrial level. Our package is analyzing the world microalgae food and feed chain in order to identify the different actors and the logistical constraints as well to analyze the environmental and economical sustainability. And our package eight is assessing consumer perception, acceptance and preference for microalgae protein. The first information we obtained from our partners was the definition of the prerequisites for the microalgal protein rich ingredients to be added to the different food matrices. It was concluded that two types of microalgal protein rich ingredients were foreseen to be developed. The purified uh, microalgal proteins uh, or uh, protein isolates and the bulk microalgal, microalgal uh, the single cell proteins. The differences between the two products are mainly associated with the protein purity. Above 60% protein content in the um, purified microalgal proteins and uh, about 40-50% with the bulk microalgal proteins. But there are other differences. For the purified microalgal proteins, it is demanded emulsifier and, and stabilizer capacity, high, high digestibility, the presence of essential amino acids to have a light color and 
a pleasant uh, or, net or neutral taste. For the technical you know, functional properties, other parameters must be considered, like water solubility, water and oil holding, foaming or gelling, among others. Between our, our parameters, our partners, sorry, a general interest was shown towards low price products, about 10 euros per kilo. Medium high prices, 30, 50 euros per kilo, were accepted for animal nursery feed to boost the animal growth. And medium high prices also for the pig and food. With, right, with the right amino acid profile, vitamins, and uh, antioxidants. Of course, all this information helped us to identify some critical points on the development of foods with microalgae according to the actual knowledge on this microalgae and thinking with the consumer's acceptance and their willingness to pay for the quality on these products. Before starting any development, several points are used to be considered. The first one is the purpose of the microalgae, microalgae inclusion into the food. Uh, do we add uh, the, um, the microalgae to increase protein content, or do we, we add it for uh, uh, increasing the antioxidant value, or whatever? But it's important to fix the purpose to face, proper, to face properly the, the development. The second is about the expected attributes of the products that are also important. Maybe it's easy to accept a green color in pasta or in a vegetable cream, but will it be accepted for sausage? The same happens with the odor and taste. And depending on the product, it becomes difficult to mask the flavor with aromas or masking agents. Texture can be also a critical parameter, although at the levels of addition normally used below 10%, usually do not become an excluding factor of the microalgae addition. Nevertheless, it must be considered for the processing parameters. Uh, the functional properties uh, can limit also the addition of microalgae protein in some foods. As an example, the water solubility may depend on pH, and this could affect to the inclusion of microalgae proteins in beverage, for example, and among others. No? Finally, consider that the market objective can affect the success of our development. It can happen that a vegan consumer is willing to accept products with uh, the attributes not associated with the conventional products, but uh, maybe other consumers can reject it. Knowing the needs, we must look at uh, which microalgae strains fits best to our product. The attributes uh, changes in compositions, aspects, and technological properties depending on each strain. At the beginning of the project, only three strains were available for food developments. At this moment, we have some other strains as a result of the research and development done. These new strains are more appropriate to add them into the product for its color and taste impact. In this slide, we show the aspect of several strains. If we wish to avoid a color impact in the product, of course, then the white or uh, honey mm, or golden chlorella stains will fit better to our objective. Therefore, the strange improvement and selection becomes an important task to facilitate the addition of microalgae into the foods. An example of development in foods is the addition of microalgae in vegetable creams, where the objective is to have a vegetable cream that can be labeled as high in protein, in which protein provides more than 20% of the energy. Depending on the microalgae strain, the level of addition changes. Only 1.5% spirulina is required to be included in uh, to be included to be labeled as high in protein. While if we use a smooth chlorella, it is required four times more, six percent. We can see the changes in color due to the microalgae addition, but the smell and taste are also different. And the most different one of them is the vegetable cream with Tretacelmis cheese that has a stronger fishy odor and salty taste, since Tretacelmis is growing up in seawater, while the others have been growing up in sweet water. Finally, uh, the, the, the last example is uh, the development um, uh, of uh, adding the microalgae in, energe in energetic bars where the objective is to improve the nutritional value of the energetic bars. In the image, we can see the impact of the strain and its level of addition on the color. Other 
texture parameters are still analyzing. Eh? But uh, once the most successful formulation of each product are obtained, the next step is to validate the best ones with the consumer study to assure a good success in the market. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation, Josep, and for sharing the insights and all the beautiful colors as well. The recommended maximum consumption for macro algae per day. She says, is it uh, five grams per day or is it less or different? Um, usually with the sweet uh, microalgae, would, there is not many constraints about it. Maybe the, 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 the algae that has been growing out in salted water, maybe iodine can be uh, a limit. Huh? Mm -hmm. But um, it, it depends also because uh, the iodine concentration uh, is not all uh, constant always. Then it's good uh, to, to know these values eh, that can limit. Uh, just this daily consumption. But this with uh, algae, mm, mm, no, 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 it's not this limit. Maybe Celine is also uh, referring to the um, recommended daily intake from a regulatory point of view, not, not so much from taste, but from a regulatory I, point of view. Um, uh, there, uh, I th mm, under my knowledge, there is not any. Uh, restriction. Yeah, yeah. All right. This, uh, this uh, yeah. heavy metals that can have the. Okay. The okay. Well, maybe uh, Celine, if you like to leave your message or we leave the email message of Rosep, you can be in touch with each other later on on this topic. And if anybody in the audience has a question or an idea about this, um, feel free to share so that we will all gain a little bit of extra know how. Mm -hmm. Um, so my question would be maybe uh, to you, uh, Jose. You've, mm -hmm. you've explained right what you um, have been doing uh, all the way to bars. Is there now something that you're going to do in the next, um, let's say, 18 months on finding new applications? Uh, well, um, we will work also in with um, energetic drinks. Okay, we'll okay. try to implement or implement to add uh, some uh, isolate proteins uh, uh, in uh, energetic drinks. Of course, we, we need to, to go further with the uh, energetic bars and also the, the creams. But mm -hmm. okay, there's still a way to go. But um, well, I hope we can finish with the good results. Yeah, okay. The focus is on a new application and bars. Sir. There's a question here from Tim, I think. I saw he, it looks like he wanted to raise his hand and then pull back. Uh, Tim, do you still would like to ask a question? Go come forward, I think. Not sure if it's possible. If, if Jim okay. can write the question in the chat, there's another yeah, one I see right. here from yeah. Iomid. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you could do that in the chat, Jim, uh, I think there's a technical thing by giving you speaker rights or something, if that's okay to type it. But meanwhile, yeah, the question uh, from what's the what's the freshwater algae strains popular in the food industry? What are the freshwater? The freshwater, the sweet water algae strains popular in the food industry. Well, uh, spirulina would be uh, the one, uh, the sweet water. Spirulina would be the most popular, the, mo the most known. But now it's most, uh, um, chlorella, Bulgaris chlorella, it's also an strain that is, 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 uh, we are working with and developing yeah. products with them. But probably spirulina is the, the, the most uh, common, or the, the most known one. Yeah. Also for uh, supplements, uh, dietary supplements. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, can we take two questions um, sure, before we move, I, if you have time? That sounds, that sounds good. I see one from I, Iomid right now. What are the challenges being encountered in production of protein for microalgae and about scalability? Uh, what are the challenges being encountered in production? Uh, okay. Uh, 
this should be better to address to to our colleagues in World Package uh, Three, yeah. because they, they they are working with with this uh, issue. Mm, yes, I better uh, just do perfect. And and then there's another one about do the cells need to be burst to be digestible? Mm. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, in fact, uh, we are using um, with uh, energetic bars and they are not uh, burst. Um, uh, but I don't know the differences on on uh, on the quality, really. Yeah, maybe the idea is here that um, you know you have a pH 1.6 in your stomach, right? The pH will will maybe have an effect on the cell walls, and then the cell walls will open, and then the omega 3 and the other nutrients can come into your bloodstream or into your intestines. And in some cases, maybe they are the, the algae are not digestible because the the cell wall is too hard. So we add it, but we don't. Maybe get the nutritional value from it. I think that's behind the question. Yes, mm. could be. I cannot answer really. Please continue with your questions, and maybe um, Josep and uh, uh, Marie, and also later on uh, Israel, you can answer to the questions as well if you know something, right? Okay. Please feel free. Okay. Then, indeed, we are moving from the um, bars to another big good uh, with Israel Hernandez and he is with also Irta uh, uh, as a pro future partner in Spain and uh, yes. please uh, explain what you've been doing okay well uh, I'm gonna be talking about bakery products developed with microalgae additions in in previous work, we were we have been working with four different uh, strength levels of um, flours, being this Manitoba bakery flour, wholemeal wholemeal flour, and organic flour. These were assessed with two different levels or concentrations of spirulina to see what was the impact of spirulina protein. Uh, within this bread matrix, as as of, as you can see in this in this uh, label, it is it can be seen that the spirulina protein or the spirulina biomass had an important impact both in texture and color of bread loaves as it can be seen in bakery in the bakery one was the one without uh, or was the one with a uh, uh, higher impact in in the loaves uh, hate as it can be seen the alveolar structure was was the impact and the and it has a greenish color colorization in this case um, this project was developed uh, like one year ago and it was a uh, the results, the obtained results, uh, was, were that. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, technical issues, but in these in these steps. <clears throat> For the Pro Future project, we were assessing spirulina, chlorella, and tetracelmis biomass in three different levels 
our concentrations 1.5, 2.5, and 3.5% in the, in the addition of grissini or breadsticks, crackers, and muffins. These products were evaluated according to another ProFuture partner, the, the Kales formulations. First, we have the grissinis. As you can see, the dove aspect uh, with the different concentrations of microalgae are kind of funny. We have three different greenish colorations depending on the concentrations of the microalgae added. Here we can see the already baked breadsticks that were um, after uh, assess, assessed um, nutrimentally and sensorily <clears throat> uh, analyzed by a sensorial panelist of theory people. As in total protein content, we can see that uh, against the control samples, the protein enhanced that uh, microalgae enhanced the protein content in with the three different microalgae tetracelmis, chlorella, and spirulina, both, both tetracelmis at concentration 2.5% and chlorella 3.5% were the ones that had the highest levels of total protein content uh, from these breadsticks. Uh, according to the analysis carried out, we can see that the antioxidant capacity <coughs> uh, for these microalgae were higher with spirulina at concentrations 3.5, with a DPPH uh, analysis, and with a and for FRAP antioxidant capacity was spirul also spirulina at concentration 3.5. These analyses were carried out with, uh, with uh, fresh weight samples. And also for phen total phenolic content, it can see, you can see that at concentration 3.5%, Spirulina had the highest levels of total phenolic content. To continue with the sensory analysis, it can be seen that the <clears throat> results are kind of similar for the three different microalgae, but it, it can be seen that well that chlorella at concentration 2.5 had the global the higher global acceptance so this will be the result for the result for grissinis here it can be seen as I was uh, commenting before, that chlorella at concentration 2.5 had the highest likely moderate uh, global perception level. And <clears throat> this is a good result, good result since at higher levels of microalgae, the people had to or had perceptions of tasty salt or salt like a salty taste 
in samples. But <clears throat> it can be shown that at this concentration, people can accept this microalgae in bread sticks. Then we can go to a muffin analysis. These were assessed the same way with tetracelmis, chlorella, and spirulina of the same concentration as I told you before. These were the results. The higher impact of microalgae was in tetracelmis with a greenish coloration, with a harder greenish coloration, depending on the concentration against the, the other two microalgae and the control samples. Total phenolic content and antioxidant capacity were also measured, showing that chlorella in both concentrations 2.5 and 3.5 had the highest amount of antioxidant capacity uh, that is accord according to the total phenolic content that was assessed to these muffins. As you can see, FRAP has, has the same results. For sensorial analysis, it can be seen that muffins with chlorella concentrations at 2.5 and spirulina 1.5% have the better global acceptance against the other concentrations or the control samples. And finally, we have a crackers assessed analysis. These are the crackers that were analyzed and sensorially proven by the panelists the same concentrations and the same three microalgies. Antioxidant capacity was higher for the concentrations in 3.5% in the three microalgies, as the same as in FRAP and DPPH and total phenolic content is had a higher concentration in 3.5 for spirulina. Global acceptance in, in crackers was better for chlorella and spirulina at concentrations 1.5. And these are the packages that were, de that were developed and given to people so the sensory analysis will be carried out. For overall, con for overall conclusions, we have that Grisinis with a chlorella 2.5 concentration were the most acceptable by people, followed by for the muffins with chlorella and spirulina at 2.5% or 1.5% concentration and chlorella in crackers with 1.5 and the spirulina also 1.5%. These products will be next tested in real industrial conditions. Next step will be Rioche Nutrimental and Physical Chemical Analysis. The shelf life analysis will be carried out within six months for crackers, grisinis, and croutons. And some product trials will be developed with gluten-free, as a gluten-free products. Aroma additions and selected for, from selected formulation will be carried out also. And that's all. Thank you. Many thanks, Israel. Thank you. Go ahead, Sam. I'd like to invite everyone to put their questions into the chat. Um, and we have about three minutes for questions at this point. Um, maybe, Israel, could you let me know how do you find the product testers? Are they uh, like researchers, friends, people from the, the public? Um, how does that work? 
Um, sorry, I, I didn't understand that. Uh, so the the people who try to try the breadsticks, try the crackers. Who who are yeah. they? Other people that work at at IRTA or? Yeah, the the same people that works here at the at the center. So we were like um, from desk to desk, giving them the package with the crackers, the grissinis, or breadsticks, and the and the muffins. Perfect. And then I see one other question, but I'm. It's um, from Max, and it's how do you cope with limiting off flavors caused by the LJ? Um, it is there uh, something that you guys can do to to enhance the flavor? Uh, yeah, for example, we have been uh, testing different or trying to mix the the products with uh, regular base uh, food. So it can be like a, this taste can be like lost, you know, if, for example, uh, previously some one or two years ago, uh, we were, we worked on a with, with flour tortillas from Mexico that were mixed with uh, fish and kind of those kinds of food. So this microalgae taste will be like a, mm -hmm. A covered or yeah, I that's what we have been doing more likely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I see there there's another question in the chat. If if you'd like, you can respond to it in the chat. And I'd like to invite uh, Marie to. Um, share her screen and give the presentation on innovations in microalgae and pasta. Thank you very much, Israel, for a great presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. We introduce uh, Marie-Christine Baune from the Dill Research Institute uh, in Germany, a very important research institute where there's a collaboration between industry and actually the institute. Industry companies, industrial companies are members of uh, Dill and then together they carry out projects within this scope or sometimes in the regional scope, right? Also for companies themselves. So a great experience in meat-free as well, uh, looking at uh, new textured products and in high pressure, um, I think, uh, how do you call it? HPP yeah? and other new technologies you are really one of the leading fields. But you're gonna talk now about application in pasta. Please go ahead, Marie-Christine. Yeah, thank you, Gerard, for the nice introduction and uh, welcome to everybody. So today I want to tell you a little bit about Chlorella vulgaris application and pasta. So why did we choose pasta? On the one hand, there was the project partner Tradizioni Padane from Italy. They produced traditional pasta and um, wanted to have pasta with microalgae. They already have a pasta containing spirulina you can see on the picture and um, the idea was uh, to have um, yeah addition of highly valuable algae ingredients in normal pasta um, the acceptance may be good because uh, green pasta already is uh, accepted by consumers uh, a green sausage may be not the best product and also storability of pasta is quite high and especially for small um, small companies who cannot produce large amounts, uh, storability is a big question. So at the beginning, we only had one ingredient. It's uh, the smooth chlorella vulgaris from our partner on microalgae. It's the light green um, chlorella vulgaris that is produced by fermentation. And for the pasta, we only had two ingredients, the chlorella vulgaris and durumwitz semolina. 
And uh, as you can see, comparing the macronutrients, so the semolina has a high carbohydrate content, while the chlorella has a protein content of 26% and also a high dietary fiber content. And especially in case of micronutrients, we have a, a high calcium and sodium um, content in the microalgae, um, but also a higher um, salt content. But especially this uh, sweet water microalgae that is produced by fermentation has a very low iodine content of 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 per milligram. And uh, yeah, microalgae are famous because they have uh, a lot of B vitamins and also here especially uh, vitamin B3, B9 and B12 are present, but in comparison to semolina also vitamin C, while for example vitamin B9 is lower. How did we make the pasta? We had a commercial pasta machine, which is normally used by yeah, gastro industry. And as ingredients, we only use tap water, the semolina, and the smooth chlorella. And uh, yeah, so kneading and fo forming was made by the machine itself. We're using different dyes for different types of pasta. Afterwards, the pasta was dried under specific conditions in a chamber. And then we made some physical analysis. So these are just some pictures. So we use 3% and 5% chlorella because the uh, Tradizioni Padani, they prefer organic labeling. And since it's not an organic ingredient, uh, we are not allowed to use more than 5% in the end. And um, you can see um, the fusilli, which we made for sensorial analysis and the Zane plates, which we made for um, physical analysis because it's easier if you have a plain area. You can also see uh, the small pictures of the non-dried um, lasagne plates. And what you can see here is that normally they had a really cool bilious green color, but up on drying, they became a little bit more brownish. And uh, due to the pasta machine dye, we always had the problem that the top, size, uh, the top side and the bottom side of the lasagne plates had different colors. Um, yeah, but this was a specific problem of this specific machine and we could not overcome it. So in case of physical properties, we first analyzed uh, how much water was still in the products uh, after drying. We did this by infrared drying and just determined the water loss up on drying. And it was in all samples about yeah, 10 to 11 percent which is fine with the EU regulation saying that in dry pasta, the final humidity must be below 12%. Then we analyzed the cooking time. There's a defined protocol how to do this. And uh, again, for all samples, um, there was no significant difference, even though the control sometimes had a little bit higher cooking time, but also a higher standard deviation. We always did this in tap water without addition of salt because some of the algae we tested, um, they have uh, salt included and this may change the, the cooking time and therefore we did not add additional salt to see the effect. And uh, we also checked the water absorption, so how good the pasta is swelling in water. And here was a significant difference, so the swelling of both uh, chlorella containing pasta was uh, slightly reduced. Then we measured the color um, with the colorimeter, so the LAB values. L uh, is in case of high values, the white, and in case of low values, black. A uh, is red in case of positive and green in case of negative values. And B is yellow in case of um, positive and blue in case of negative values. And I always measured the top and the bottom side. And I did this before and after cooking. So what you can see uh, in, the, in the graph is that the L value of the control pasta is much higher. So it's lighter. Um, while there is always a difference in the uncooked um, lasagne plates uh, between top and bottom. 
a significant difference where well, this is not the case after cooking, except for the pasta containing 3% chlorella. And uh, in case of the L values, the control is a little bit more red than the greenish um, chlorella pasta plates, uh, but the chlorella pasta plates are a little bit more yellow. And um, we also calculated the Euclidean color distance it's uh, yeah, saying that if the values are quite small, you cannot detect them by the eye, so if they are around one. But what we can see is that before cooking, they are really big, so we have values of nine to five, and after cooking, they are smaller. So we can definitely say, uh, yes, the color difference of the bottom and top side is reduced after cooking. Afterwards, we... Um, also measured cooking loss and cut resistance. The cooking loss is very important because uh, if the pasta is not stable, you may lose a lot of material during the cooking process. But again, for all samples, the cooking loss was quite small and there was no statistically significant difference. And in case of cut resistance, um, we had one major problem because uh, we made three independent productions and the values of each production, they did not, did not really fit to the values of the other productions. So it was a bit hard to compare the results. The problem is that for the lasagne plates, you have a specific dye and the, the gap is not fixed. So you always have to fix the gap again. We did this uh, just with a small um, metal plate but maybe it was not accurate enough. And if you have uh, differences in the size of your pasta, then also the cut resistance is uh, varying. And we always cook for 10 minutes. And if the pasta is thicker, they are not as cooked as uh, if the pasta is thinner. So um, from, from the results here, we could say that the pasta with 3% um, chlorella, with 5% chlorella addition, um, and with 3% chlorella addition, both did not vary from the control, but uh, they varied significantly uh, to each other. In the end, we also made some scanning electron microscopy pictures just to see uh, whether there are differences in the microstructure. So in the left, you can always see the outside, which was in contact with water and on the right is the middle of the lasagne plate. And just uh, to show you where I zoomed in, I marked this with the small boxes. So first a picture of the outside. What we can see here is a, yeah, a mesh of, uh, of protein structures and um, that the, the pasta is swollen uh, from the outside and that the level of swelling is decreasing uh, the far you get to the middle of the pasta. Um, and there's one big difference because in the, in the pasta containing 5% chlorella, um, the, there's a bigger mesh and also the swelling is uh, to a higher degree. And this indicates that uh, they may have a marshier consistency. Um, if we have a look to, to the inside of the pasta, we cannot see um, big differences. So there are typical pasta structures, especially st starch granules, which are embedded in a gluten network. You can see on both uh, sides. And beside the starch granules, you can also see uh, sometimes very small round um, chlorella cells that are embedded in the gluten network. So from a nutritional point, um, we also calculated whether yeah, all essential amino acids are present and whether there are changes within the mineral or vitamin content. So what we can see if we compare semolina and uh, chlorella is that in semolina, um, leucine, lysine, and threonine are limiting. Um, while in the chlorella, non-essential amino acids are limiting. But when we mix them, um, so 
3% chlorella or 5% chlorella. We, we increased the amount of these uh, essential amino acids, but still lysine and lysine are um, limiting. And in case of the mineral as vitamins, um, we get a higher content in calcium in the mixtures in zinc and also in vitamin B3, but also a lower content in uh, vitamin B9. And uh, all recipes allow for claims that, that they are source of protein or source of fiber, but this is just uh, yeah, also the case for the control because the semolina is composed in a way that this is uh, true. So concluding, uh, we could say that um, the processing was not differing, so the power consumption of the machine was the same for all samples. Um, but yeah, we had the problem that the processing was not standardized, so we had th different thicknesses of the lasagne plate, and therefore the cut resistant was inexact. But I think if Tradizioni Padani is repeating um, the, the production on their own devices, um, the results uh, may be comparable and we can analyze uh, the pasta then too. Um, yeah, so there were nearly no changes in the physical properties of pasta containing 3% and 5% chlorella. And if there were differences, they were rather small. We have a slight improvement of the nutritional properties, but still lysine and lysine are limiting. Uh, due to the organoleptic properties, so due to COVID, we had the problem that the sensorial studies could not take place in-house until now. But we, we now do the training of our panelists so that they um, yeah, are professional to compare the pasta samples. Uh, but what I can say is uh, that, of course, they have very slightly fishy off odor and taste. Uh, which is more pronounced in the pasta containing 5% chlorella, but in my opinion, um, both products are still acceptable. And yeah, especially in the future, we will then do the quantitative descriptive analysis and acceptability test with the consumer panels to understand if the products are also ready for the market. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Mary Christine. Thank you so much for uh, a lot of uh, very interesting stuff related to Italian foods, which are uh, always very yellowish or reddish because of the tomato, but now they've turned green. Um, let me have a look if there are some questions in the chat. Not, 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 not at the moment. I was wondering maybe on the shelf life stability, right? The rancidity, the last slide that you mentioned. Um, if you, but if you would make fresh pasta, would you have the same uh, challenge, or uh, is it only when you are doing it with, you know, drying and then prolong the shelf life? So I think if we make fresh pasta, of course, uh, the color will not change. Mm -hmm. So and then we have this uh, nice bile green uh, color, but yeah. of course. Uh, shelf life will be not as long so well, i'm not sure but i think three weeks or something like this is the normal shelf life for fresh pasta yeah yeah and then and, and would you then still have the fishy odor or the, the challenge with the taste you think um the the odor did not change so the fresh pasta and the dry pasta was the same same okay that, that's that was the question all right um yeah and try uh, is saying um Fishy odor might be a problem for vegetarians. They don't expect that uh, to uh, to have in this type of food. Yeah, but I'm not sure. So, of course, um, they don't eat fish, but I think they expect something if they buy a pasta with algae. And so, I don't know, for 20 years you can buy these uh, nori plates for sushi and so on. And of course, uh, you know that they taste fishy. So. I uh, me, myself, I am vegetarian, and um, I think it's okay. So I expect that they taste the fish, so it's okay that they taste like fish. They come from the sea, yeah? right? Yeah. 
And uh, but the question of Shri is actually how to improve the odor, which is the holy grail. Do you have the holy grail, and where? <laughs> Um, I think there's only one possibility, and that's to improve the ingredient itself. Because, uh, yeah, so the, the only other way is to reduce the concentration in the final product. So you cannot eliminate the, the taste or odor of the product. So Could you do it with CO2 extraction to get rid of the oils? That's I, so I think, yeah, maybe we we did not try. So um, what what was done within the project is that uh, new mutant strains have been created that contain, uh, for example, less chlorophyll and uh, therefore also have improved color and taste. And uh, I did not show the results, but we also used the white and the honey chlorella to make the pasta. And they, of course, have a nice color because they look like the like the control in case of the white chlorella and like a really nice uh, egg pasta in case of the honey chlorella because it's really a yellow pasta. And, and they also do not taste um, or that they, they have a fishy taste, but it is really, uh, yeah, if you don't know it, you, you would not recognize that they have been added. I don't see any more questions, Shannon, do you? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Marie, for your presentation. That was fantastic. I loved seeing all the pictures of the, the pastas and breads and um, different developments of the strains of, of algae uh, today. It was a really, it ended up being a full circle um, in, in the end of, of how to improve everything. So that was really great. Um, Gerard, would you like to say a few words to close off the webinar today? Yeah, that, that's fine. Well, the first thing I think is, uh, let's say, we'll be back somehow in the coming uh, year with a little update. So um, if you have any questions, indeed, as uh, Shannon and Barb had mentioned, and also in the chat, you see the name of Massimo Castellari, who is the leader and the scientific uh, coordinator of the project. So you might be able to um, connect with him on things that have been published. Uh, some know-how is also still in the development for publication uh, so that not everything can be shared, but you could really connect with the right people uh, from a production uh, growing or maybe processing point of view. Um, and, uh, well, uh, to say a few words maybe about the, the bigger picture, when you talk about um, LG protein in particular, um, we just finished uh, another webinar as bridge to food on microprotein. If you like to see the recordings, please feel free to connect with us. Also an EU project, which is great uh, with uh, the new source microprotein. And we will be doing a webinar, which is related to our uh, ecosystem, the ecosystem of bridge to food on the investment opportunity. Uh, you know that in uh, particular in Europe, uh, more money um, is going to be set aside, hopefully, for research on alternative proteins. But they need direction. They need help. And say, so where should we spend the money? And together with the European Plant-Based Foods Alliance and others, we are trying to work on getting more projects funded uh, in the right direction in plant-based in the future in Europe. That's where this plant-based investment opportunity webinar is all about. Um, talking uh, application, uh, because this is an application webinar, we should look at the word courses. And at the courses, there will be, uh, again, involvement of this project, where you might be able to taste and to see and to touch and to smell, and maybe to like as well, definitely, hopefully, um, um, these products. There is also going to be another company called Sophie's Natural. This is a startup from Singapore with an office in Wageningen, and they're working on, yeah, how do you call that, algae that um, are not getting any light. Uh, so they, um, uh, how do you call this, uh, Gossep? Um, going, going, the algae strains without light. Do you know? Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, algae protein. It's white. 
uh, because there's no chlorophyll being made in the algae. So there's a little bit more on algae at the course, but also other proteins that are being discussed, like soy, potato, um, uh, black, um, black rapeseed, as well as uh, spelt and, uh, and barley. And, and then, of course, at the summit, uh, uh, Massimo will also be present to do a presentation on the project. And this is a little bit the timeline of what we are doing as Bridge to Food connected to these projects. Feel free to connect with Shannon or with Barb or myself if you have any questions about what we do and how we can help you, uh, because that's what it's all about in this world, to help each other to make it easy and quick, convenient and fun. Having said that, I think um, if there are no more questions, I would like to ask you all for a big applause. Raise your hands for the three speakers, Josep, Marie-Christine, um, Israel, and also for Shannon and Bob to organize everything. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic evening or afternoon, and we hope to stay in touch with you.